Well, last week we left off where we begin here today. Are you actually a saint in Jesus Christ? Is that even possible? The Bible gives us many ways or pictures to describe what it means to be a Christian, but a central one is this. Those who are in Christ are saints in Christ. Okay, but what does that look like? What difference does that make in my day-to-day life? And by the way, I'm still really not over the idea that that's even possible. Well, that's why we're here today in the book of Philippians. These are essential questions, not because of who I think you are or even who you think you are or what you should be called, but because this is clearly who God says you are when you have put your faith in God the Son, Jesus Christ. And this whole idea of being a saint is essential. It's an indispensable thought as we begin our study in this letter to the Philippians because everything in this letter materializes out of that five-letter word. A saint is anyone who is in Christ. That's a thought for us today. Saints are each and every one of God's holy ones who are found to be in Christ. A saint in God's eyes is anyone who is in Christ. Paul's not writing to potential saints. He's not telling us about dead, venerated saints. He's not telling us about a quality of sainthood that is unobtainium to us lesser people. No, by the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to people just like us, saints. How can this be? Well, today we'll see. It's because by putting your faith in Jesus, God declares you to be one of his holy ones. By putting your faith in Jesus, God declares you to be one of his holy ones. And this matters for each of us today, no matter who you actually think you are, because being a saint makes all the difference of who you are in Christ in community, in the world. Who God declares you to be, who Christ makes you to be, makes all the difference in how you relate to this God right now and forever, and how you relate to both those saints that are around you and the world that's all around you. Well, anytime we open God's word, we need to turn to him for help, especially with such a weighty topic as this. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have eternal fellowship with both you and your saints. We ask for your mercy and grace today so that we may understand all the more who you declare us to be. And we ask for the transforming work of your spirit so that we may all the more walk before you in this world as saints, lights shining in the darkness with lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ask this now in his name. Amen. Let's turn in our Bibles to Philippians 1, verses 1 through 2. If you want to use the Pew Bible, it's on page 980. And as always, you can keep that Bible if you need one or want to give it to someone that needs one. And this is what it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers. We'll pause here for just a moment. If you're an elder in this church, would you please stand up and just remain standing for a little bit if you're an elder at Grace River? I'm standing already. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. If you're a deacon of this church, which means God's local servants, would you stand up? If you're a deacon in this church. We have a lot that are also downstairs at this moment. And to back up for just a moment, if you're a saint in Christ church, would you stand up? I'm really glad the elders did not sit down when I said that part. So, 
All right, now we know what we're working with, so you can all sit down, be seated there. Well, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at how he puts the Father and the Son in the exact same sentence. Jesus is full deity and he is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, when you first look at Paul's opening here on the surface, it doesn't look terribly unique from his other letters or to be truthful, even from the common form of Greek letters in his day. Notice people then started with their names. It's Paul and Timothy, both of whom this church knew very well. Paul and Timothy had been there at the very beginning when Christ was making saints in Philippi. This dynamic duo had been there when God opened Lydia's heart by the water side and when Lydia then opened up her house to the other people who were coming to faith in Jesus Christ, people like the Philippian jailer. And Paul and Timothy had continued to pour into these disciples over the next decade. And the church knew very well who Paul and Timothy were in Christ themselves. Timothy is likely included not just because he is Paul's secretary, that he wrote down what Paul dictated, but Paul could and would point to Timothy as a prime, living, and rare example of the very Christ-likeness that Paul would call these same Philippians to mirror. Timothy was one of Paul's closest associates and partners in the gospel And Paul will speak of him in chapter 2 with such tenderness and warmth as someone who, as a son with his father, has served with me in the work of the gospel. Timothy, Paul says, is a sacrificial servant to others for the sake of the gospel, a man who echoes in his life the same self-giving love of Jesus Christ, which Paul is going to sing in a hymn in chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Timothy, like Paul, is a living, breathing saint. A saint who is a servant. And that's just how Paul introduces both of them. Servants. Servants of Christ Jesus. Paul often leads his letters by describing himself as an apostle. But here there's no such lofty title He doesn't start the Reverend Dr. Paul of Tarsus or the leading church planter of the world, head prophet and seer of the church of Jesus Christ, or as is more common today, global lead vision caster and influencer for the gospel. No, he just writes simply servant. And that brings us to our first insight of who a saint really is. Saints in Christ are servants. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is actually saying here. The Greek word is common enough in your Bibles. It's used 120 something times in the New Testament. It's the same word and you should turn there to look at it for yourself. It's the very same word that Paul's going to use of Jesus Christ in Philippians 2, verse 7, when he says that Jesus took the very form of a servant or a slave being born in the likeness of men. The word is doulos, and it means someone who belongs to another, a bond slave, sometimes translated a bond servant, somebody without any ownership rights of their own. Now, honestly, when I said that, did you recoil just a little bit or a whole lot? To be a saint in Jesus is to be a slave to Jesus. Now, in our world, slave is a word which you almost hardly dare utter because it comes with so much baggage and stigma, particularly in our country with our history of the transatlantic slave trade. But even in the world of the Philippians, it had a stigma and it had weight. 
And they knew what slavery was like far more up close and personal than any of us ever will. Some estimate that 20 to 40 percent of the population in Philippi were slaves, doulos. Slavery was not race-based or generational at this time, but it was far less and far below being someone's servant. You were property. Stephen Lawson writes, a slave actually belonged to his master. He did not have a life of his own. Further, a slave did not own anything. He was entirely dependent on his master to meet all his needs. Neither could he travel anywhere without his master's consent. His entire life existed to please his owner. There are other words Paul could have used to describe himself as a servant. In fact, one of those words he uses in verse 1, diakonos, where we get the word deacons, which means one who serves by waiting on others, by meeting their needs. But Paul didn't use that word. He chose to identify himself as a doulos, a slave. So what is he identifying himself as exactly? Someone whose life belongs to his master, who lives to meet not his own needs, but those of his masters, all of them. Someone in whom himself owns nothing, but is dependent upon his master for everything. Someone who's wholly dependent on his master to meet all of his needs. He's not his own man. He's not the captain of his own ship. He's not the master of his own domain. He goes nowhere without his master's consent, and his entire life exists to please his master. That's an absolutely astounding reality to say out loud, isn't it? It's not at all how many people present the Christian life today. Under a lot of the preaching I hear, pastors pose the exact opposite. God exists to do your will, to make your dreams come true, to bless and enrich your life, to serve you. And while we're put off by that very term slave, ironically, the New Testament uses that word in a very high regard, for it means to be like Christ. And wrapped up in the Christian usage of that word as Paul's using it here, the meaning bond servant or bond slave of Christ, is the idea that a saint is not begrudgingly in the service of his master or her master, but someone who willingly submits and lives under Christ's authority as their follower, as Christ's follower. You know, when the Lord liberated Israel out of Egypt, He freed them from a bondage that was physical and emotional and spiritual, a slavery in Egypt. And He told them that the Israelites, when they were freed, were now not to have slaves in perpetuity. There was a set time. After six years, you had to let your slaves go free. They didn't pay you anything. But at that time, and you can find all of this in Deuteronomy 15, if the freed slave wanted willingly to remain with their master, there was a very special ceremony. This is what it says in Deuteronomy 15. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, I command you this day to set your slaves free. But if he says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he is well off with you, then you shall take an awl and put it through his ear into the door. It's like making an earring. And he shall be your slave forever. You know, doorpost, nails going into wood, there's a whole lot of imagery of Jesus Christ right there, right? We need to come back to that in chapter 2 when Paul talks about Jesus becoming a doulos to set us free. 
But know this for now, Yeshua, Jesus, has permanent scars in his body. You know that, right? That he has retained those nail holes, those piercings, and his flesh was pierced to wood. And why? Because he loves you and your lost human race. Because he willingly submitted himself to serve. Doesn't it take on all sorts of new meaning hearing that verse to hear now the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve. Jesus came as the ultimate slave, the ultimate servant whose glorious scars set you and me free to a life in Christ. And this is exactly why Paul is using that word and why he's not ashamed at all to call himself a slave. Because he identifies himself as all saints should in Christ, with Christ. Those who are in Christ are being made like Christ. And that means we too willingly submit our whole lives in a servanthood under a new master. In Galatians 6, verse 17, Paul says, I carry the scars of Jesus on my own body. That word scar is stigma or stigmata. Paul says, I bear the marks of belonging to Jesus Christ. We saw ourselves in the book of Acts. He literally bore the scars of being beaten for being a saint in Jesus Christ. But it's also his heart that has been pierced He belongs, even right now as we're sitting here, Paul belongs to Jesus Christ still. You know, dear saints, this is precisely what we sang today, what that Christian word means, redeemed, and Jesus paid it all. It means you've been bought with a price, so now you have a new master. In the ancient world, people went to a slave market and they paid the price for a slave. They redeemed that slave. That slave was not free unto themselves, but they had transferred ownership. We just heard that word from Deuteronomy 15. The Lord your God redeemed you, he told them in the Old Testament. Well, what exactly happened? God not only brought, but bought Israel out of Egypt. They had been slaves to Pharaoh, crippled in a debilitating bondage that was crushing their souls and their bodies, and the Lord liberated them. But when he liberated them, he did not free them to just live unto themselves. He did not free them so he could make their dreams come true, or he could remove the obstacles from their lives so they could reach their potential or have a breakthrough, he blessed them. That is for sure with a true life, a life that could overflow with milk and honey, and a life full of his truth and his law and his presence. But notice something. You can read for yourself right in Exodus 8, right before that plague of the frogs. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, Let my people go that they may serve me. The exodus out of Egypt was a transfer of ownership. Slavery to anyone or anything else besides God is soul-crushing. But real life is found where saints find it, in service to God, in belonging wholly to the Son, in being slaves to Christ. This is the great exchange of the Christian life. It's a change in masters. Before you were a saint, you were a slave to sin. You belonged to sin. It reigned over you. It had dominion over every facet of your life. It had a power over you. You obeyed sin. You served sin. You could say you were a slave to the passions of this world. That's the same thing. You belong to your master or father, Satan. That is true. 
or you were a slave to yourself, but it's all the same thing. And following your heart, you were locked in to a bondage in sin. Sin was not something you just did. It was something you were. It was your identity. It was your being. It was your master. You can find this, of course, in Paul's own words later on in Romans 6. But in the ultimate exodus, Jesus, he liberated you through his life and through his death and through his resurrection from slavery to sin so that you know now no longer present your bodies as sin instruments for unrighteousness, but you live to present yourselves to God as those who have been brought out of death and into life. So now that your members, your body, your being, all that you are, now serves the Lord as instruments for righteousness. You've been transferred by Christ's grace out of the domain of sin and darkness and into his promised land. You no longer belong to the world because a price has been paid for you. You've been redeemed No one has a claim on your life anymore, not Satan, not sin, not the world, if you belong to Jesus Christ, because now he owns you, and he has bought you at such a high price, so you can wholly and eternally belong to him. And this is why saints are slaves. You're free in Christ, but you're not free to live however you desire. You belong to Jesus. All of you, all that you are, all that you have, all your desires, all your skills, all your being, what Jesus has done for you is like what God did for Israel. What he has done is actually liberate you to a better slavery, and he's given you a better yoke because it's his slavery, it's his yoke. You can share with your friends today or tomorrow or this week that human autonomy is an illusion. Some religions and some philosophies and certainly a lot of our own politics promise freedom. But really, there is no such thing in the way that we use that word commonly because everyone is a slave to something. Everyone. The only question is, to whom or to what are you enslaved? Who do you belong to? You spend your life serving Christ, the master who will lovingly provide all you need and in whom you have the highest service, the highest honor known to human existence. Or you can spend your life serving something else or someone else. And that's the dividing line of human existence right there. The pastor Skip Heitzing puts this in an unforgettable way. There are saints and there are ain'ts, and that's all there is. There are slaves to Christ and there are slaves to sin. If you are a saint in Christ, your life is not marked necessarily by ecstatic experiences or power encounters or miracles but it is certainly marked by a submissive will to your master. People will know to whom you belong by who they see you serve. Is your life marked by a submissive heart to Christ and his word? Is your life marked by a joyful slavery in Jesus Christ? Paul and Timothy's lives were that. They rejoiced in being Christ's servants, his slaves. It was an honor and a blessing to them. And if you know anything about Paul, that is ultra astounding because this same guy, once upon a time, he was a slave to himself, wasn't he? And to his moral record. And he spent his life trying to kill the name of Jesus, and now he rejoices at being a slave of Jesus. Dear Christian, do you know that same joy? Is your life pierced with the scars that mark you as one who belongs to Jesus? 
Jesus told you, like he told me, we cannot serve two masters. The Christian saint has to make daily, almost moment by moment, choices on whom you will serve and whom your house will serve. There's forces all around you and some still lingering within you that want to enslave you. Your career, your pornography, your spending, your relationships, your fears, your hobbies, your politics, your passions, your sins. But we have to decide who will we serve today. When I was in seminary, our school wanted to beat this idea into you so badly that almost all of our courses were called servant as something. They wanted to beat into you. You're not that great. You know who you are? You're a servant as pastor, servant as counselor, servant as preacher, servant as theologian. And every time you looked at your syllabus or your report card, it's like, hey, buddy, if you didn't know by now, you're a servant. Remember that. But it's not people just like Paul or pastors that need to be reminded of this. We all do. Who are you in Christ? You're his saint. You are his slave. You belong to him. We sang that. Jesus paid it all. To him I owe all then. Rejoice in that though and live freely in that because from the moment your head gets off the pillow in the morning to the moment it crashes back down, you have one overriding mission. How am I going to please my master today? And I know I had a good day. If when my head crashes, I can say to some extent, I brought glory to his name. Well, let's get back to this word saint here some more. I mean, we have to at least finish the first verse today. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. Well, let's just explain that a bit here. Saints in Christ are people who are set apart. The very important word here is hagios. That's what the verse says. It says, to all the holy ones in Christ. That's what saint means here, the holy ones. It's what it means to be a saint. You are holy because you have put your faith in Jesus and now by being in Christ, you are in the Holy One Himself. And when this happens, you don't suddenly get one of those yellow orbs behind your head that stays there permanently and all the pictures at the MFA. Nothing suddenly marks you apart visibly different, but you are certainly suddenly marked apart as different. When the Bible uses the Greek word hagios or the Hebrew word kodesh, that's the picture that it's giving is somebody who is different, set apart, cut apart. Those who are God's holy ones are things or people that are different from others around them. They are separated from the profane, from the secular, from the ordinary, from the sinful. When Christ comes into your life, he unites his holy life with your life. And you become very literally a new thing, a new creation. He separates you from the world and from the you that you used to be. He doesn't put you on a pedestal. That's not what it means by being set apart. You don't get to look down your nose at the world. It's not as we used to say in the South that someone is holier than thou. But your life is set apart because it belongs to the Lord. Because you have a new master, you simply can't look and live like the world anymore. Because you're now indwelt by God, the Holy Spirit, your life will not, cannot be like those around you. You need to be distinguished from the world. In the first century, a temple was called hagios because it was set apart. It was different. It clearly was not like the other buildings next to it. And everyone could see that and understand when they walked in there that was different. It was not something common. And that's your life, dear hagios, dear holy one. 
Your life is set apart to be used by Jesus, the Holy One. This does not mean that you retreat from life, that you live in a convent, or that you have to live in a Christian commune. In John 17, Jesus prays to the Father for the exact opposite. He says, I'm sending them out into the world as sheep among wolves. And our Master has commissioned all of us to go into all the world and make disciples make fellow slaves of Jesus. But as he sends his holy ones, we are to be distinguishable from the ones to whom we are sent. Not because we have unique uniforms like my sick friends, or we have those nice ties like the Mormon missionaries and the white shirts, or because we do eccentric things. Christians are distinguished because being set apart in their hearts this ripples out into daily decisions in their life, in their lifestyle. Visible displays of being set apart in their priorities, in their desires, in their loves, in their choices. As Christ makes you a saint, his holy one, you cannot compromise with the world around you. We're constantly tempted to blend in with the world to look like our neighbors, to lust like our neighbors, to spend like they do, to consume like they do, to worship like they do, to watch what they watch, to talk the way they talk, to live carnally as they do, to live for ourselves as they do. This is even a pressure in church. We want to be relevant and appealing, so we try our hardest to make church look and smell like the world. We actually don't want to be different. We want people to walk in and feel totally at home and that nothing here is strange or different. But the church, and that means you, as the church, has to be different, not strange not unwelcoming, never offensive, but always loving, always compassionate, always merciful, always sacrificial, always serving Christ and not ourselves, always worshiping Jesus and nothing else. But did you catch what I just said there? That means to be set apart. What I just said is not acting like the world that is distinguishable from the world. And that's how we are to live set apart. Later, Paul's going to tell these people that they need to live lives worthy of the gospel as lights shining into the darkness. When we are a saint set apart in Christ, we have the light of the world as our master and the light of the world now united with us. And he sends us out into a dark world as his little lights, shining forth his name. And that's why we're useful in his world. But salt that's lost its saltiness and lights that don't illuminate are useless. A compromised saint is a useless saint. The world around you, at your office, at your farm, at your school, they don't need more of themselves. They don't need the world. They need Christ. They need to hear and see Christ and to witness His holiness shining out of your life. You have been separated from evil and commissioned by Jesus for His purposes. And one of the great purposes He's called you is to live a holy life, set apart, as the holy ones of Jesus. It's by standing apart, we don't draw attention to ourselves, but we draw attention to Christ. We don't want anyone to say, how holy are you, but how holy is your God, when they witness our life. That NASA aspect of being a saint goes right with this, and hopefully it brings greater clarity. Saints in Christ, as we live set apart, we need to remember we have two passports. Read this with me again. 
to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Your Bible might say at Philippi, but the preposition in in Greek is the same word. It says to those who live in Christ and those who live in this town called Philippi, a Roman colony. You can think of it as having dual citizenship or living simultaneously in two worlds, two overlapping worlds. You remember at this time, to live in Philippi is a great privilege. It's a great place to live. No taxes. Being a Roman citizen. It's got the prestige and the beauty of a mini Rome. Paul's going to have to tell them later, but remember, you're first and foremost a citizen of heaven. Your first identity, your first primary passport is in Christ. And that's the first part of this. To be a saint means that you are in Christ here. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. That's a powerful, packed phrase. But for now, we can just take this away. Saints in Christ are people who, by putting their faith in Jesus, now belong to Jesus. They are in his kingdom. They are in his family. They are in Christ, so they're in his new covenant. Your whole life is now reoriented around Jesus, in whom you find your being, your very purpose for living, your breathing. Being in Christ is your chief identity, your enduring hope. As we sang today, Christ is my all and in all. He's the center of my life. He's the consuming desire of my life if I'm a saint. And that's why saints will willingly forsake all else to be in Christ because they want to have Christ above all else. My family, my hobbies, my career, my retirement, my past, my present, my future— They're not just subjected to Christ, but they actually all get made sense and get redefined and reoriented by now my life being in Christ. If my life is in Christ, I am looking and trying to love my wife with the love of Christ. I'm working my career as unto Christ. I'm parenting my kids for the sake of Christ. It it changes my life because now my life revolves around Christ. He's not my Sunday activity. He's the center of my life. You're a saint in Christ because your life is now, in biblical words, hidden in Christ. It's not you who lives, but Christ who lives through you. That's why Paul can write, to live is Christ, to die is Christ. It's all Christ for him. Life is Christ, death is Christ, today is Christ, tomorrow is Christ. All of my life is in Christ, forever in Christ. In a world obsessed with identity right now and identity politics, dear Christian, dear saint, you have an answer to say, my chief identity is I am in Christ. That's who I am. Over being an American or a boy or a girl or anything else, I am in Christ. But saints hold that second passport. Here, the saints lived in Philippi. They had a local address. God had not taken them out of the world, but he sovereignly kept them in the world, in Philippi. And they were to live, as some of us have heard many times, in the world without being like the world, set apart. But they also needed to live in Christ without despising or rejecting or neglecting the world into which Christ placed them in Philippi. Their allegiance was always to be to Christ, but their lives were spent in Philippi. They didn't hover above the ground. They were someplace. There's at least two big takeaways for saints in this. Here's the first. You need to live responsibly engaged in both of those worlds. In the kingdom of God and wherever he has sovereignly placed your life. You don't live with a foot in both worlds, but you 
Live as Christ in the context where he has put you. Living apart, there are places you cannot go in Claremont or Springfield. There are things you cannot do as a Christian. But you also cannot retreat from those places. As Christ kept these saints in Philippi, he has kept you in a particular place for a very particular reason to take Christ to them and to take them to Christ. Saints are doing this right, I think, when we seek the betterment of our own Philippi's, when we seek the good of the city, the betterment of its social fabric, and we get involved to do something. And the absolutely greatest thing you can do to get involved in your Philippi as an engaged citizen is share the gospel with the town in which you live, with the people in your neighborhood. That is a pressing challenge for me and for you. Who are you taking Christ to in your neighborhood? Are you waiting until that short-term mission trip to Haiti? Or are you going to cross the cubicle aisle and talk to that person? Or that woman in the grocery store? Or the guy at the homeless shelter? I'm trying to live this out in my own small town. I've started going to the local civic meetings, the school board meetings, the selectmen meetings. I care a lot about my kids' school, and I think Jesus wants me to care about my whole town. And I'm hoping to make a gospel impact that the people I meet there, we don't just make my town a better place, but I can share Jesus with them. But there's more to intentionally living in your Philippi When was the last time you prayed for people in your town? You see, we're not just taking people to Jesus, but we're also taking those people to Jesus in prayer. As dual citizens, we we pray. Dear God, do something here in my town. Open up hearts, just like you did for Lydia and that jailer, starting with the hearts of the people living under my own roof and the people working right next to me, and the police chief, and the firemen, and the caseworkers, and all those brick buildings, and those kids at Maple Ave, and at Disnard, and God, don't just start with the kids. Would you open up the hearts of their families to trust in you? And dear Christ, help the people at my church open up our mouths and actually talk to these people. When there's A great thing about these saints in Philippi also, just as Christians live together as residents in Philippi, they live together in Christ in Philippi. Paul is not writing to individuals here. He's writing to a church, a very specific church, one with specific elders and specific deacons, a growing church, a real church. And of course, we're reading this because this letter has universal meaning for all saints in Christ. But I have to tell you this, if you are not part of a local church, almost all of this letter will not actually make sense to you. Because Paul is writing, as most of the Bible is, to a collective people. People who are sharing their lives together, growing together, studying God together, spurring each other on, praying for each other. You simply cannot do that in an online church. You can't. And this is from the guy who moved from Silicon Valley. It doesn't work. It doesn't even work in San Francisco. A virtual church is virtually not a church. You cannot do the things that are in this letter. Grace River does not have an online campus because that's not a church. We want to get God's word out to as many people as possible, and we live stream because we know some people are sick, or their kids are sick, or they're in hospitals, or they're traveling, and we want them to worship with us. But staying home and watching podcasts, or even interacting with other Christians online, or even meeting your friends outside a church once in a while, that's that's not church. That's not the saints in Philippi. 
He's writing to a local church that is gathered together in a specific spot. And I take great comfort in knowing that you're here with me to help me navigate this tension of living in two worlds. Both in Christ and in Grace River, in New Hampshire and even in Vermont. And this leads us to the fundamental question that is underneath all of this. Saints live as slaves to Christ. Saints live set apart as the holy ones of God. And saints even live in two worlds. But how does someone actually become a saint? How do you become a saint in Jesus? It's right here in these first two verses. But I read this week in the National Catholic Register, you have to be declared a saint by the Vatican, and it takes several steps to attain sainthood. First, you have to have a certain fame for holiness. You have to die. Then a fan club grows up around you who say your example and memory has blessed them. There's a grassroots devotion, not to Christ, but to you. And you have to be dead at least five years for this to happen, unless your mother Teresa or Pope John Paul II and You can get things moving along faster. But next, you have to have a religious order or the bishop of the diocese where you died make a formal petition for you to be a saint. And then Rome sends out someone to officially collect documents and testimonies to confirm your heroic or very special things. Remember, someone's coming all the way from Rome to check your life. It should be special. The third step takes your cause back to Rome where the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, a theological commission, studies your life and they vote on you. If you pass, you move up to cardinals and bishops for their vote. If they like you, you go up to the Holy Father and he gives you a seal of approval and you're called venerable, but you're not a saint yet. Then for step four, if you died a martyr for the faith, you move to the head of the class and you get immediately upgraded to the category called blessed. But if not, you need to have people say that you produced a verifiable miracle in their life after you died. You need, they need to see that you're so good that you can even work a posthumous intercession. Then the Congre- Congregation for the Causes of Saints has a group of specialists who must determine the miracle was legit and that there's no other natural explanation but you're still not a saint. You need one more big step. You have to do one more miracle after step four, and they have to prove that you, who should be in heaven by now, you have to perform a miracle after people pray to you. They have to prove if you're so saintly, then people praying to you will work. And then, after some more committees and decisions by the Pope, You get canonized at a mass right in the Vatican, which the Pope will read aloud your life history, and then he will chant a prayer in Latin that declares you indeed to be a saint. Or you can just believe in Jesus Christ by faith alone, through grace alone, and you'll be a saint. Do you see what it says right there in your Bible? To the one you're holding in your own hands, reading in your own language, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ can be a saint. And notice these are living saints. They're living right there in Philippi. You don't become a saint when you die. But whenever you are made alive in Jesus by putting your faith in him, when you are justified by faith alone, in Christ alone. Dear ones, saints are not dead people. They are people who have been made alive in Jesus Christ. Saints are not people you pray to. They're these people you turn to right now. They're not people who have done a whole bunch of special stuff, but people who have received Christ, who has done the most special thing, Christ who's worked a miracle in my life to transform me, from slavery to sin to life in Him. You don't become a saint by doing something. You become a saint by trusting in the one who has done everything, and His name is Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, 
He unites his holy life with yours, and that's the greatest exchange in all of human existence. He takes your unrighteousness, and he imparts, he shares, he covers you with his righteousness, and that is why you can be declared a holy one of God. Holiness, sainthood is never in himself or herself or they self. I'm just checking if you're still awake right now. There's no they self. But it's never in yourself. Your holiness is always in Christ Jesus. When he unites himself, that's how you are declared before God holy. That is what makes you a saint. Look how this happens. You need to underline this in your notebook. You do not earn sainthood. It's given to you as a free gift from the Holy One, Jesus Christ. Look how this happens. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a greeting cliche for Paul. That contains his complete theology. And again, it encompasses all the other things that's going to be in this letter. In Christ, all God's people are made holy. Not by your earned position, but by union with Christ. Grace to you. Grace comes to you. You don't earn it. You don't get it from Mary or any other saint. It comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you catch that here? That's where the grace comes from. God is gracious towards you. And what happens with his amazing grace? You can live in Christ. And it's by this grace that Jesus has redeemed your life from slavery on the cross when he took all of the pain and the wrath that your sin justly deserved and he put it on himself. And he took his great righteousness and covered you. And because he did this, he won you peace with God. As we were singing this morning, Jesus brokered the only peace plan your life will ever have, ultimate shalom, because he makes you right with God. And now you can live in a relationship with God. Whomever will put their faith in Jesus Christ, believing he is the Lord Christ, then God gives you grace upon grace and peace everlasting joy multiplying peace because he makes you right with God. How do you become a saint? Just like this. You confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved in Christ Jesus. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. But for those who will not trust in Jesus, you will remain sadly one of those ain'ts. You will remain outside of Christ, not in Christ. You will remain forever in your sin, a slave, instead of in Christ. You will remain in death. You will remain in an ultimately meaningless existence, lived eternally apart from the peace and grace that Jesus offers you. And that's the dividing line of life. Am I a saint or am I not? Well, I think, dear ones, as we go forward, we should rejoice at this. We should rejoice at this fact that God has made you a saint. If you've heard this today and this is your life, you have to rejoice. I mean, can you imagine if we told our neighbors this good news? I mean, the neighbors who live in your Philippi and the neighbors across the parking lot, if we walked up to them and we said, you know what, you could be a saint in Christ today. And they said, little old me? Horrible me? Are you sure? And you say, yes, I can show you in my Bible or your Bible. Right here, first page of the letter of Philippians. And it goes like this. And you can explain that to them now, can't you? Being a saint makes all the difference in who you are in Christ and in community and in the world. If you're a saint, please embrace that, dear Christian. Those are not my words about you. Those are not even Paul's words about you. Those are God's words about you. 
You need to know who you really are in Jesus Christ. And you need to walk that way today. Set apart, a citizen of heaven, responsibly engaged wherever your master has placed you with a focus on bringing him glory. And rejoice. Because I think you know the secret that I've learned. My very worst day in Christ is so light years exceedingly beyond my very best day I ever lived in the world. My worst day in Christ is better than my best day living as a slave to myself. By Jesus' amazing grace, we have peace with God. Let us rejoice and let us pray. Lord, may this truth lead us to just break out dancing in the middle of our kitchen or drop to our knees in tears today. May it put an indestructible smile on our face and reorient how we see ourselves, how we live with others, how we worship you. I pray, Lord, that your joy would well up in each of our hearts and cause us to live boldly in this world like we have absolutely nothing to lose. Who cares about what comes if I have peace with you, Lord? What's the worst that can happen to me if I have peace right now with the real God? Lord, may your people never take this for granted, but may we sing and shout and praise and serve Christ with every fiber of our being, the Lord God who by grace alone has made us saints, his people, now and forever. For that, Lord Jesus, we glorify your name. Amen.